And good evening, everybody. I'm Andrea Miller. I'm the founding board member for Center for Common Ground. So I'd like to welcome you tonight. If you haven't already done so, please go ahead and you can add your name and your state and your organization if you would like in the chat. While we are waiting for Justice Beasley, I'm going to have my team give you a couple of updates. I'm going to start with texting. We are currently texting in both Georgia and North Carolina, and we will shortly be texting in Alabama. So, there are many of you who have texted with us before. If you have seen an invitation from me, we would love to have you join us. We have finished a number of counties. We still have numerous counties to go. Texting with us using Outreach Circle is incredible quick, it's incredibly easy, and it allows us to reach at least 500 voters in an hour, possibly more, depending on how quickly you click the button. So that's my report on texting, because North Carolina and Georgia have early voting. We started texting there earlier, and we will text literally all the way through early voting. When we look at Alabama, Alabama only has election day voting. So with Alabama, we will text up to election day. Uh, now I am going to invite the postcard team to talk about where we are in postcards, and we do still have some addresses left. So postcard team. Hi, I'm Carrie, and uh, Nancy's here posting numbers in the chat. Um, we have a week from today as the deadline to put Alabama postcards in the mail, so there's still time to write some. And um, since there's no early voting there, we're aiming to get people out on election day and give them information. If you have any done sooner, please mail them sooner. It's good to, you know, not save them all till the end, but um, mail as you go. And um, at the end of May, we're going to be launching Florida postcarding. And that's going to be super exciting. Andrea can tell you a little more about the general campaign. And um, yeah, Nancy's saying we wrote 925,000 postcards this year. That's pretty amazing. And um, you guys are great. And um, I have numbers uh, 149,000 plus to Alabama, 220,000, almost 221,000 to Georgia. and. Um, North Carolina, 85,831. And Virginia, we did a very small targeted campaign um, with 17,323 postcards. So go team. Nancy, do you wanna add anything to that? Nope, that's good. I'll post the numbers in chat. But keep writing and we've got Florida coming up at the end of, um, the month and people will be very excited about that. And Florida will have a couple of months to write and we'll need it because we have over a million addresses and it's going to really rock. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a question in the chat about what is the content of our text message. First, we are texting 
in the primary black voters only. When we get to the general, we will expand because we know we'll have a larger base of volunteers. So it will be our full spectrum community of color voters. Our text messages are very informational. We tell the voters that there is a primary coming up and they have the ability to vote early in states where they are early voting. Since states with early voting give people three ways that they can vote, they can early vote, they can vote by mail, or they can vote on election day. Each mode of voting has some very, very, very specific things that people are going to need to know. So when we deploy our texting, it is heavily customized for each individual county. We always provide the registrar's phone number. And because we are texting, we do send links, but we always give people both things. So that's pretty much what we have in our texting. And again, what we tell the voters, it is based on what we know about the laws in their state and also what we have seen the election officials do. When we were texting Texas and people wanted to vote by mail, we told them it could take up to 30 days to get your ballot. And when you request your ballot, be sure to put in the last four of your social and your driver's license number. So it is purely voting information, and it is a lot of it. If you've ever done any phone banking with us, then you know how much information we provide in our phone banks. We do exactly the same thing when we are texting our voters. Um, and... Um, Justin, do you want to give our phone report, our phone banking? I would love to. So we currently have active phone banks in North Carolina and Georgia and possibly Alabama soon enough. Uh, and we are going to be phone banking right up until election day or election days, depending on the state. Uh, but it is super simple to get started. We've made thousands of calls already. I'm gonna drop a link into the chat with this link on our website it has all the information you need to get started. We have written out guidelines and training video. And we also have uh, almost every day of the week, uh, uh, guided training events, either hosted nationally on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, or from uh, other partners hosting their own online phone banking events. If you wanna hop on a Zoom call to uh, get some training or make just f make some phone calls in community with other uh, volunteers. I'm going to drop another link uh, into the chat with more information and just a bunch of different events that you can choose from to get involved based off of when works well for you. And all these uh, links I should mention that are being uh, put into the Zoom chat will be sent to you in an email later. So you don't need to worry about trying to save uh, all of them all at once. But I think that's about it for phone banking. All right, and Chief Justice Beasley has arrived, so I will make her a co-host. And then one last quick message that I'm going to give. I see people asking about the effectiveness of postcards. Be aware there are many voters where the only thing we have to contact that voter is an address. If we don't have a phone number or we don't have a working phone number, if we don't send a postcard, and again, remember, we deal in many instances with rural voters. We are not going to door knock where many of these voters live. The postcard may be the only thing they get that reminds them there is an election.
when the Atlanta NAHCP did their study in 2020 of why voters in Georgia did not vote. They gave three reasons. Reason number one, I didn't know where the voting was. Reason number two, I didn't have a way to get to the polling location. And reason number three, I didn't like any of the candidates. So that was what we learned. So postcards are very, very, very important. So what I would like to do, I am going to take the honor because our very special guest is here. Uh, Chief Justice Sherry Beasley is, I get to do the introduction. My board member is driving to Richmond. Originally, he was going to be a passenger. So it has passed to me. So I am introducing, I have the honor of introducing a uh, North Carolina candidate for the U.S. Senate, Sherry Beasley. Sherry was raised in a family steeped in faith and service and hard work. She and her husband, Kurt, raised their twin sons in North Carolina, passing on those same values. As a public defender, judge, and eventually the first African-American woman to serve as Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, Sherry worked every day to keep communities safe, protect the law, and defend our constitutional rights. And boy, do they need defending. As Chief Justice, Sherry helped to create the first human trafficking court. She created a family leave policy for more than 6,000 court employees to help people take care of their families and succeed at their jobs. And she worked with law enforcement to take on the school to prison pipeline and keep kids in the classroom and out of the courtroom tonight. Justice Beasley will be talking to us about voting rights, how she has been empowering voters in North Carolina to engage in elections, and why we as citizens must be part of the effort to get out the vote and make our voices heard during the midterms. So, Center for Common Ground, friends, staff, volunteers, please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Sherry Beasley. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I am really delighted to be here with you all for, with the center, and I, I'm excited about the work that you do every single day. Uh, Andrea gave a wonderful introduction. I want to tell you just a little bit about myself and what we're doing uh, in this election cycle to make sure we win this, this, this race. Um, I will tell you, my grandfather uh, hailed from Alabama, and he and his young bride uh, knew that the only way for them to have a future for their family was to leave the state. And so uh, my grandfather, with 76 cents in his pocket, hopped a train to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, would send for his bride, and they would ultimately have four children. And they uh, always vowed to make sure that each of those four had a college education. My grandfather actually worked for the railroad all of his life. And my mother was the oldest of those four. And they did all have a college education. My mom was amazing. My parents divorced very early in my life. My mom earned a PhD. She was a university dean and a leader in her field, all while raising me. My husband, Kurt, are the very proud parents of 21-year-old twin sons. And we have instilled in them the same values that each of us grew up with around hard work and justice and being of service to others. I've been really honored to be uh, in service to the people of North Carolina for nearly 30 years as a public defender, as a judge, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina. It's now in vogue to say you've been a public defender. And, and I have taken very seriously my responsibilities of upholding the law and respecting the rule of law and the constitution and making sure that laws are applied equally to all people. And I've also seen being in court almost every single day, how the laws in Washington have often failed the people here in North Carolina and all across this country. 
And, uh, and, and I know that people really need a senator who will stand courageously for what's happening in the state and in this nation. We live in the ninth largest state in the nation where nearly one third of the people who live here earn less than $15 an hour. And so people in North Carolina were struggling before the pandemic and they are certainly struggling now. There are a whole host of issues and you know what they are. There are rising costs and people are struggling. Everybody needs access to affordable health care. It is a basic human right. In North Carolina, we do not have Medicaid expansion, which is an abomination. And people need good paying jobs. They want a strong economy. They certainly want to make sure that we address climate change. We must address and are still fighting for the constitutionally protected right to vote and so much more. And I can tell you that same mom um, I just told you about uh, earned the right to vote 57 years ago because of the Voting Rights Act. And here we are still 57 years later fighting to protect uh, this very important right. I, uh, I, I know that uh, so many people here understand what these issues are here in the state because these issues resonate all across this, this country. But the bottom line is this, we've got to get this right. This is one of the best of three opportunities in the country to expand the Democratic majority in the Senate. So we've got to get it right. I'm very thankful to be the presumptive nominee in this case, in this race. And thankfully, since December, we've been working really hard, working on our grassroots efforts and really putting our efforts into the general election, which we know will be very robust. Um, I do have some ads up in North Carolina on TV and digitally, but our efforts really have been focused on, 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 on the general election. So we're in an exciting place. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. And will this be a tough fight? Absolutely. Um, but I've never backed down from a tough fight and I will not back down now. And I will tell you, if January 6th wasn't enough of an indication of the fragility of, the fragility of democracy, if Ukraine isn't enough of an indication of the fragility of democracy, and I certainly know that they are. Please, 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 and it's not you all here, but this is the elevate that we must, message we must elevate to our friends outside of this meeting. Let people know that this uh, draft decision, uh, and though it was wrongfully leaked, we don't need to be distracted on how we came to know the information. And I, I'm a former chief justice and I know it was not the right way to handle that. But we need to know that we have the information and where this court is taking this nation is a very different place. And frankly, while it matters that a woman have the constitutionally protected right to make her own choices about her own reproductive health, please know that this decision is about so much more if you care anything about civil rights, you better be afraid of this decision. If you need to know of a precursor that this court and this legislature has made to let us know what's at stake, we have it through this opinion. If you are concerned about birth control or same-sex marriage or voting rights or all other civil rights, they are on the line because of the way this 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 opinion has been written and i'm sure there's some lawyers here i've written i've read much much of this opinion and it is very dangerous we're headed in the wrong direction but we have an opportunity to write the course now and this election is not about just today it is about future generations that we've got to get this right and i will tell you i know we were all told that the 2020 election was the most important election of our lifetimes but if my late mother were here with us today, she would tell us that every election is the most important election of our lifetimes. And we've got to fight. We have got to fight. We must understand what is at stake in this election. And I think the people who serve on the court, but I also think with all of the rancor and malice and hatred and vitriol that we see in so many of our leaders uh, who are in service, they have also let us know that it is time that we must not, we, we cannot, we cannot relent. We must fight for justice. And we must make sure that the next Senator from the state of North Carolina is one who will stand for what's right and call out what's wrong and who will lead courageously in her service to the people of the state 
and to this nation. So I thank you all for having me here and I'm certainly glad to answer a few questions at this time. All right, thank you so very much. Josie has some questions. So Josie, take it away. Hi, Chief Justice Beasley. Thank you so much for being here again. Uh, my name is Josie. I'm the Deputy Policy Director here at the Center for Common Ground. Before I get started with um, the questions I have, we had one in the chat from our folks in Alabama, um, wondering where in, uh, what town in Alabama was that your family was at in? <laughs> My family is from Northern Alabama, from uh, Athens is where my grandparents were from, but that whole little tri-city area, Athens, Decatur, and Huntsville. Oh, that's great. Our two Democracy Center leaders are based in Huntsville, Alabama. So Alabama in the house today. Um, so with that, you know, as you know, as you've told us, you really know North Carolina well. You've been a public servant in that state for over 30 years. So I know that we are curious to hear a little bit more about how you would describe the, the state of voting in North Carolina um, and what we from all across the country can do um, to help get out the vote in your state. You know, um, we had uh, this, this of course was a, a redistricting year for us uh, and everywhere else. Uh, our Supreme Court, state Supreme Court found the initial maps as drawn were unconstitutional. And so we certainly know the importance of state courts. Uh, and thankfully they have been re redrawn in a way that are pretty decent. We actually have an opportunity to pick up two seats uh, here in North Carolina. Uh, is there some gerrymandering? Absolutely. And it often impacts people who live in rural communities as well as people of color. And so, you know, I, I think the best thing to do is to all of us, make sure that people in North Carolina, but all across this country, realize the power of the vote. And we must understand that the voting rights would not be under attack if when we exercise the right to vote, we stand for what's right and we win. So they understand and, and really appreciate the power of voting and that's why they're making all these efforts to suppress our right to vote. Uh, we will always have to fight against, uh, until we uh, change the course, uh, election subversion and voter uh, suppression, and we must do that. And so I am asking everybody, uh, if you're on social media, please put the word out. Uh, everybody, we're all interconnected in some kind of way, and I'm sure so many of you are connected with people here in North Carolina. Please, please don't assume because people are informed or they have this kind of job or whatever tap people on the shoulder people get busy distracted and all that and let them know the importance of voting in this election cycle it is so very important and the other thing too is it's expensive um, i will raise a minimum of 60 million dollars that's six zero million dollars in this election and so as you are able and willing to make contributions to this race, I certainly appreciate that. But if you just reach out to the people here in this, in this, in this state, we also have no, no card writing. We also have phone calls, phone banking, texting programs, and so much more. So there are things you can do to be in support of the campaign without ever leaving your home. And certainly if you wanna to come to North Carolina campus with us, we're going door to door. Uh, we didn't do it in the 2020 election cycle. We were trying to be really safe. Uh, but we also know that we must engage voters and, and touch them and be in their communities uh, to be successful in this race. And so we are building our infrastructure and prepared to do just that. So if you want to come to do that with us, we'd, we'd love to have you as well. Thank you. Um, let's see. I guess this is, you've kind of commented on this already a little bit, but is there a specific strategy that you have um, within your campaign um, or just as a member in your, in your community that you're using uh, to respond to restrictions that the legislature has passed um, on access to voting. I don't know if there have been any restrictions in North Carolina, but just in general in this country, as we know, it's a, a fight that we're all having to fight now. You know, uh, we uh, really don't at this point. Uh, we Last election cycle was the first time we had vote by mail. And, and that's, that's a huge thing. Uh, people utilized it during the last election cycle. I hope they're doing so now. And we also have early voting and then uh, election day voting. So uh, that piece is, 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 is really important. 
Um, but there are not really a lot of restrictions uh, other than, I, so I don't want to suggest that, I mean, because we do have, even though the, the maps look better than they did, we certainly have gerrymandering. And in rural communities, that means that uh, polling places are often farther uh, from where people live. Uh, that's a real barrier uh, to, as, as the stats were just mentioned about people actually being able to get to get out to vote. Uh, but in terms of uh, legislative barriers, uh, other than redistricting, uh, uh, other than gerrymandering, which is a big, big deal. So I want to discount how important that is. Um, but our, our campaign really is working hard to engage voters all over the state and to also let voters know on university campuses what the rules are around voting. And so on some campuses, they run a line uh, uh, down the middle of the campus and split one precinct into two. And so it's important for college students to know that um, and to make sure that they're changing their voter registration as they're moving from one dorm to, to the next dorm. So helping people to know what the rules are has been really important to whether they're on college campuses or uh, in communities across the state. Great, thank you. I actually, I see, um, well, Andrew just answered this too, but is there an organized effort to provide rides to the polls um, for folks in rural North Carolina? We know that there are a lot of C3 organizations that are providing rides uh, to, to, for folks uh, to the polls, that's correct. Cool, ride to share to vote I know is a good one um, for folks that are on the call today in North Carolina. Um, you can maybe help with that. So I guess I have one final question. I know you have to hop off in a little bit. Um, this is just, you know, beyond doing our work to call voters and engage them in the elections. What is a message that we can also be spreading to help people realize the promise of democracy and the value of voting, um, voting their power and making their voices heard? You know, that that is the message. Uh, and it's, it's not enough for us to just be angry. Uh, we have got to make sure people understand what is at stake. And this case, sometimes we can put people in buckets and think, oh, well, that doesn't impact me or my family, or this doesn't impact me or my family. But we have to realize that the way this opinion is written, all of our civil rights are at stake. People cannot afford to sit on the sidelines in this election. We must all be engaged uh, and help people to understand the magnitude of this race and every other race and what is really at stake and what's on the ballot. Um, and, and, and our civil liberties are on the ballot. Uh, justice is on the ballot. Uh, and who we are as Americans is on the ballot. And a, a, a small percentage of the people who are in leadership who are rendering such decisions and, uh, and, and, and leading in malice and hatred don't represent the majority of who we are in this country. And so we, don't, we dare not let them take over. We must right the ship right now. And we really don't have a choice about it. Uh, I shudder to think, as I'm sure each of you does, what might happen if we sit this one out. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Andrea. I don't know if you have any final words you want to say, but thank you again, Chief Justice, for taking the time to be here with us today. I appreciate um, it. Thank you all so very much. Please know that today we launched Military Families and Veterans for Beasley. You can go to the website at sherrybeasley.com to join that group. We have Women for Beasley. You can go to the website and for more information about the campaign. Uh, but I thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for all you do in the name of what's right for people across this country. And I certainly thank you for your support for my campaign. And thank you very much, Chief Justice. I know you are in the thick of it. Thank you so very much for taking time out of what must be an insane schedule right now, getting ready for that actual primary coming up on May 17th. So good luck to you. Godspeed. Thank you so very much. Take good care. We will. All right, that was pretty darn exciting. A little more partisan than we normally hope, but it was still exciting. 
Now, another very important thing, and I am going to say it at every one of our meetings, 2022 is going to be a historic year because there are Black candidates who will be on the ballot for U.S. Senate in seven Southern state. Now, I'm not talking about Wisconsin. I'm talking about the southern states. So we will probably see Chief Justice Beasley. We'll see North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, of course. And even though we don't work in Kentucky, we will see Kentucky, and I should always be looking at these states when I say them because I always manage to miss one, but there are seven. I'm always great about getting six in. Think about it. The first time in U.S. history where there will be that many African Americans on the ballot for you as Senate. And we will actually give you an opportunity to meet a couple more of them. Again, very, very exciting. So there are some questions that I'm seeing in the chat. We are beginning to prepare data for Florida now. We will be postcarding 1.2 million, well, we will have 1.2 million Florida addresses. And those will be available. The primary is August 23rd. So, um, those will be available. Um, when will those be available? When do we think we're going to actually open up Florida? The end of May. The end of May. Um, May 22nd may be a little early, Catherine. Talk to me, let me know how many addresses you need. And um, I can maybe handle those by hand. I don't know that we will be completely ready uh, to release the addresses by May 22nd. So we will be working with our wonderful democracy center leaders, Doug and EC. We will be convening the Alabama partners to get them ready to do texting. We are thrilled with our new data vendor, PDI, as an example of the quality of information we are getting. There are 85,092 18 to 24-year-olds in Alabama who are Black. PDI had 85,000 40 cell numbers. So in other words, there were only 50 people in that very key group that normally does not vote in primaries where we've got cell numbers. So we're going to be able to text them. I cannot tell you how exciting all of this is. And we are getting reports from people who have been phone banking into uh, especially North Carolina that they are really getting an opportunity to talk to a lot of voters. So we know our phone numbers are good. Possibly the best quality numbers we have ever had. So I'm ready, willing, and able to answer some more questions. And then I'm also going to be happy to let people go home early. Andrea, there's one question from Adrian um, in the chat, which is, is there a growing need to expand voting rights efforts in other states? Um, 
Oh, other states than the seven we are you are focused on. We're actually focused on nine states. And we go into a state if the voting age population is at least 20% community of color. So there are states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, where yes, there are tremendous voting rights needs. However, the population is well below our required 20% voting age population. For instance, in Texas, the voting age population is 55.21% by Black Indigenous people of color. Florida is 55.69. Louisiana, Louisiana was the other state I mentioned that has a Black candidate for Senate who will be on the ballot. Louisiana is 53.99. North Carolina is 39.10% and Georgia is 38.62. I deal with these numbers every day of my life. They are burned into my brain. So that is why we work predominantly in the South because that is where statewide we have the largest percentage of Black population. Well, Black Indigenous people of color. North Carolina and Georgia will be majority minority states in four to five years. So when we see the insane voter suppression in Texas and we hear about all the different gerrymandering and things they are trying to do in Florida, that is because they know that they are no longer the majority in those states. The problem is our voters do not understand the power that they have and the whole power dynamic has really shifted. And that's why it's also so important for us to make sure voters in states like Florida, Texas, North Carolina, Georgia, are informed about all these changes to their ability to vote because people are trying to make it more difficult. And while we can't out-organize voter suppression, there's a lot we can do to make sure that voters feel empowered and informed and prepared to cast their ballot. Uh, yes, and thank you for that, Josie. And one of the things that we do is when we find out and we can see because we do watch the legislation in all the states where we're going to work, we know what laws are up and we do work with local groups on the ground to help them fight that legislation. The legislation that's in Georgia, SB202, is a very bad piece of legislation. It would have been much worse if we hadn't worked with people in Georgia. The original plan and the original goal of SB 202 was to completely end vote by mail in Georgia, to make it roughly only available with a very few excuses, probably like Texas. You needed to be over the age of 65. You needed to be disabled. There would probably have been a list of about five or six reasons that you could use. <laughs> People in Alabama are going, yeah, like Alabama, you can only vote by mail with an approved excuse. But they were not able to make that happen because there was such a hue and cry against it. So yes, virtually every bad law in um, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, Josie worked with groups on the ground to put together advocacy alerts. Gabe, worked with Josie and Justin to get phone banks built for the legislators who were introducing these bad bills. And we called their voters. And while we can't lobby, there's no rules that say we can't tattle. 
And so oh, we told the voters, you voted by mail, right? You told us that was your voting plan. Did you know that your state senator is putting in a bill to end vote by mail? Like what? Would you like to call your state senator, state rep, and give them a piece of your mind? And then we would use apps through calling. So yes. And um, again, Justin talked about training. If you want to make phone calls with us, and again, we are calling Black voters, and it is a very different phone call than if you have called for campaigns, because we are providing information about voting. One of the other means of suppressing the vote for some while expanding the vote for others is when we look at early voting. Early voting in many southern states is other than at the registrar's office, which normally is conveniently never ever on a public transportation line frequently moves. It may be in one place during the primary and somewhere else during the general. So unless you are on the internet, have a computer that assumes a certain level of privilege, it's very easy for voters to not know where the voting is. Also in urban areas, not all vote centers open on the same day, they are not all open at the same time. So voters who work may struggle to figure out what is closest to them that happens to be open at a time when they can go. So those of us with computers who are here on this Zoom tonight, we are indeed privileged. That is not the entire country and many of the voters we work with are voters that are on the wrong side of the digital divide. So I will take one last question. Uh, do I have one, Josie? I don't think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. If folks I have one, we, feel free to raise your hand, but otherwise, yeah, we can wrap it up, I guess. Um, I am loving this. We are going to get done early. Thank you. Well, we, we've got a nice, small, intimate group here. So I am so delighted to have you folks join us tonight and take care, everybody. And remember, this year, 2022, seven African Americans will be running for U.S. Senate in November. And while most of the country has no idea that this is happening, this is something that I see as a cause to celebrate. And among those seven candidates, we have three women. We met Chief Justice Beasley tonight. South Carolina only has three Democratic women running for Senate. And in Florida, we have Val Demings. This is going to be an incredible midterm election. So based on the gift that the Supreme Court just handed us, the tide may have totally shifted. So I want to leave you with that very, very strong, positive thought. And everybody go sit down quietly and have a very good evening. We will all be back hard at work tomorrow. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Good night.